chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in, turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome, dear listeners, to Season 15, Episode 24, the final episode of this season. I'm your host, Otis Jari, and in this episode I'll be performing three tales to terrify you, courtesy of authors Dale Thompson, Micah Edwards, and Seth Paul. Tonight, we'll hear stories of infernal automatons, mouthy monstrosities, and insidious intelligence. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the tear, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. Ah, <laughs> yeah, the show is about to begin. <laughs> machines, machines, machines. We ask them to do so much for us, and what do they ask in return? Well, not much. Really, because they're machines. But if they did, I'm sure they'd ask for a cup of coffee, a little bit of kindness, and a nice opportunity to take over the world. Well, I can tell you, they're certainly not going to be taking over my neighbor's house. You recall her, don't you? She always... Well, she's been off and on again on various antics, but oddly enough, she seems to have vanished as of late. So much so that it looks like there's a for sale sign in the yard. Not sure what the statue of missing persons is in this area, but it seems a little sudden for my tastes. Anywho, we begin our season finale with a tale from Dale Thompson that begins with a bang. Quite literally. You see, looks like here, that sweet meteor of death everyone's always talking about finally showing up and it did a little more than just throw up enough dust to kill off dinosaurs that no longer exist. No, this one wakes up a whole host of unpleasant folk that seem to take a liking to all those AI companions we've been building. Let's take a look and see how that's all working out, shall we? Without further ado, I present to you, We Are Legion. Below the silver rills were pools plucked from other worlds, planted in the craters 
left from the unforeseen impacts that removed so much. Unfortunately, so many were not prepared for such a cataclysmic event. Semi-delirium followed shortly after once the initial shock of the devastation wore off, leaving mental scars that metamorphosized into night terrors for anyone who was cursed to remain. Some still retained the incessant and constant throbbing from the concussion of the first wave, which left not a single person on their feet. Some huddled together with a loss of purpose and dignity, and no one preserved their identity. Catastrophe makes all people equal. Everyone struggled and strained sullenly to come to terms with the loss of life, the destruction of most everything standing and erect, and the ghastly carnage and human suffering. It would take some days to learn to cope, and others it would take months to shake that feeling of revulsion. If it took more than months, then morbidly frightful not coping is only referring to the dead. Unpleasant poisons waft through the air, stagnating the oxygen and depleting the breathable air. Objectionably, some refused the air apparatuses, still clinging to their conspiracy theories that the Illuminati was behind this. If there was an Illuminati to begin with, even their bunkers, safe rooms, and hideaways in the hollow of the earth could not have withstood a direct hit. All that remained were fragments, pieces, shards of glass, everything charred and burnt. The trees and the grass were blackened and brown, covered in soot, but mainly just toasted to a crisp. No one had to be buried right away. There was hardly anything left to bury in most cases. Those of us who were not eradicated learned very quickly to adapt or die, improvise or go without. The earth was splintered and no one was immune, though some seemed to still have more than others. No one was thriving. Every day was a new day. Obviously, fresh discoveries were made, otherwise I would have been long dead. There is something extremely dangerous here, and as scary as it gets. You see, I was raised in church and was taught that a spirit could not inhabit inanimate objects. I'm here to tell you that the preacher I used to listen to is probably long dead and didn't have a clue about such matters. I'm here as an eyewitness and can honestly testify that the claim of a spirit possessing a machine is a real thing. I can attest to it because I have first-hand knowledge of it and have verified it personally. You see, when the sky fell, hurtling enormous rocks and gigantic pieces of the sky upon our heads, we assumed we'd all die and artificial intelligence would go offline because it needed power, battery backup, solar power, and electricity to generate an enormous amount of energy for proper function. This simply did not turn out to be the case. One AI training alone was gobbling up as much power as 100 ohms. One would expect, once there were no more power plants, that the AI would exist until its battery backup systems failed and they would end up as rust buckets where they seized up. Here's the good thing about the AI crash. 626,000 tons of CO2 emissions no longer pollute the air. On the downside, we ended up with something far worse. We used to hear about the carbon footprint when people were trying to save an already doomed planet. No one mentions a carbon footprint any longer. Planet warming and carbon emissions are no longer a thing, just like global warming. Those are outdated terms, though climate change is real. A perfect example would be to say, one day, we cannot breathe clearly without our respirators, according to how the wind is blowing, but the next day you can. So yes, it's ever-changing. When the cosmic horror assault came upon the Earth, with a barrage of boulders the size of buildings colliding with the terrestrial, mountains were leveled, oceans swelled with tidal waves and tsunamis, 
crashing the shores, dragging the land away and sweeping coastlines clean, birthing precipices that no man could approach. The ground split open, and the cracks speared the heart of the earth to its core, releasing an enemy once chained by angels. The world grew dark, and the monsters from untouched bedrock crawled upward to what they knew. They clamored for hosts in order to live in a man's world, but few men existed. They wandered aimlessly until they realized they could not possess that which they could not find. Man had hidden, covered themselves, concealed themselves, and only came out when the sun was shining through the canopy of the gray aftermath. They'd been unleashed from their imprisonment for only days when these less-than-divinities, called demons or phantoms from the abyss, found that they had the ability to inhabit the AI through the geothermal infusions that had been receiving for millenniums. They were more than adept at controlling these robots with their vitality and newfound vigor. The demons realized that AI was much easier to invade and occupy because they had no emotions. They were void of self-will or volition. They were unfettered by fear or rationale. It was as simple as moving into a vacant home, cold, fleshless, with nothing to corrupt, pervert, or manipulate. When the demons, on their campaign of selective mortality, found few humans to embody, AI was the logical choice for these dreadful dark powers. Imagine a deserted world, a grueling landscape for the scattered few who can only move in concealment, utterly terrified, along blackened earth with smoky gray rivers of stagnant waters. No place was safe, vaguely and innocently distraught, reluctantly taking the next step, hesitantly breathing too heavily, disinclined to live another atrocious day. But mankind is astonishingly adaptable, needing little intervening influences to be creative, to make something from nothing and to push on, not thriving or being uniformly prosperous, but contriving among the slow, smoldering aftermath. The cruelty is explicitly clear, and we who are vulnerable, who have grudgingly gathered together, can only be described as shrewd survivors. The invisible harries of death had clearly hidden away in the machines of war, creating enigmas difficult to defend against. Yesterday we lost a good friend who impulsively and treacherously believed he could take no more and had to chance it. Unreasonably agitated and frantically despondent, he said he would cower no more. He disconnected himself from our modest community. He became practically exultant, going out on his own, as if he was about to change the world. Against our wishes and ignoring our pleas, he has now ceased to exist. This late and sorely missed lamented friend. There was nothing left to bury, for when he emerged to face the demon who occupied the AI, he was no match for the entity who had haunted us. The merciless thing, the vilest upon the land, abandoned the machine and endeavored to take possession of our friend, who then, in a state of mindless catatonia, threw himself from a cliff into the inferno of no return. We witnessed this from our hideaway, high on the mountainside at the mouth of our cave. The time had come to stop moving but to do so would mean our fate would be no better than our friends. The outcome would be the same. Everyone was uneasy and fearful that he'd be found out and penetrated. The anxiety was indescribable. We all agreed that the wretched, intensely troubling way of life we were maintaining was not sustainable, and soon we would be depleted and have to relinquish our position again. To move would mean certain exploitation of which the diabolical demons could take notice of. As much as we wanted to plant our feet and grow some roots, it was imperative that we did not become complacent or submissive. We were being pursued by a relentless enemy. If we were spotted, 
the demon would instantly break into a maniacal fury against us. We might be wise to remain where we were for the time being. We were not ready to sacrifice any and all of life's comforts. Here we had defense and sober precision to remain relevant and formidable when we needed to be, which was the key to survival. Our community numbered 19 people, respectively. We were 10 men, 5 women, and 4 children. We had been capable, as long as we stayed ahead of the lonesome monsters, that prowled for us. It was survivable if we were at least two days ahead of what was known, but we could not rest, for the unknown could abruptly arise and disjoint us, overtaking our camp in a way we could not recover from. Every day we wearily watched and prayed, sleep-deprived, with our endurance being tested minute by minute. We were deficient in food, water, and proper sanitation, but we managed as we scavenged. When the day arrived for me and three others to embark on a loot and forage run, I will admit I had nervous jitters. I'd been on many of these prior to day, but for some reason the dread of ruin was upon me. My mind was stimulated with images of obliteration, harm, and disastrous consequences. If we were unsuccessful, or if any of us were lost, there was a strong probability that our company would have to relinquish its position too early, which could spell peril for others. It would be letting go of the wheel at a high rate of speed on a winding road with no railing. Every outing caused us to learn something new about survival. The harsh climate and landscape were a tutorial in adaptability, challenging our mortality almost like a roll of dice. To gain the best vantage point and probability of achieving our goal, which was to locate supplies and return safely back to the camp, all in one piece, we had to be realistic, practical, and unrelenting. Our eyes had to remain open, and we could not afford for our hearts to give out. Today's breathing was doable without the respirators. It was not unreasonable since the sun was out and the wind was blowing, not allowing the pollutants and contaminants to settle. I had seen the remains of homes on the upper ridge. I had hoped that the house was nearly crushed by the concussion of the many impacts in this area and had not burned. With everything in sight being charred black, the thought of success was disconcerting. But I pushed the superfluidity of doubt away, and the four of us began our journey. I estimated it to be a four-hour round trip, returning to camp well before dark. We were admittedly not mountain climbers, but we had the tools and gadgets. We made the ascent from our cave to the rock face and up to the top in 45 minutes. For a real rock climber, they may have contoured the cliff in five minutes, but being novices, we took more time. The two men and one woman with me were Erlanger, a 37-year-old college student from New York, Henderson, a bartender from Austin, Texas, and Rachel, a 25-year-old primary teacher from Tucson, Arizona. The camp nicknamed me Hydra because I seem to have more than one set of eyes. My given name is Timothy Nixon. Once we reached the top, we were elated, practically jaunty, to find four large homes. These homes were not on gas supply. They were solar-powered and ran on electricity. This was probably why they didn't explode or burn. They were dilapidated and unsafe, but we had to explore. Our hope was that no one had beat us to any valuable supplies. We had to claim these opportunities when they were presented because we had many failed expeditions before this one. We needed food and water more than anything. We had gotten used to boiling all of our collected water and eating practically anything up to the point of decay. Stepping over rubble and listening intently for the sounds of the house, for I knew the sounds that occurred right before a crash, I made my way to the kitchen, and I couldn't believe my good fortune. I was surprised to find victuals. Two large boxes of oatmeal, some canned products, and a six-pack of canned soda. This was a jackpot. 
Rachel was going through the utility room, where she unexpectedly found a first aid kit, some rubbing alcohol and batteries. These were live-another-day pieces if we were playing a game. When bad things happen, they happen very quickly. Not anticipating visitors, we were unexpectedly taken off guard. I heard the unmistakably whirring sound of an AI. Rachel could appear inept for confrontation because of her small frame, but she had sent many a demon back to the cemetery once I had known her. She was not my visual, but I heard her spout out some orders. Brace, do not move. AI habitation by a demon is cumbersome for the demon and puts them at a disadvantage. When people become possessed, their mixed emotions, confusion, and fear cling to anything of relevance for explanation, and the demon inside embraces the human soul which only seeks comfort. But in the bosom of pure evil, the human soul shrinks and is unsettled and manipulated until the spirit of man submits. Within an AI, the demon perpetuates alone and thus becomes trapped in the AI, having to use most of its energy through a series of vibration sequences to free itself. In some ways, the AI becomes containment to the devilish fiend, but this is only temporary. A demon is not submissive, but rather a raving lunatic, adhering to no authority but its own. These deprived entities, as formidable as they are, can become vampiric in their bloodlust, but can be warded off and even vanquished with good old-fashioned crucifix, which seems to repel them. Everyone in our camp had a crucifix, but not many of us adhered to the religion or even prayed because we felt as though our initial prayers were either ignored or that God had moved too far away to hear them. I don't mean to say that I disbelieve, I simply may not understand how God works. These imperishable creatures of hell, whose venomous hellish sights were set on mankind, were prepared to devour us, yet we were equipped to contend with their savagery just as well. As often as I'd faced them, an abject quivering dead, which I could not see, dried my mouth, swelled my throat, made my palms and my hands clammy, reminding me that Fear is to be human. With the most unheard of concentration and more ready to preserve my life than to forfeit it, I retraced my steps back to where Rachel was either cornered or had an AI cornered. When I turned the corner, I saw Rachel against the wall, weapon raised. Our guns could dismantle an AI with one shot, but that did not completely prevent the demon from working itself free of the machine. It took some time to do so, and in past encounters, it gave us just enough time to retreat. I spoke to Rachel and didn't know I was standing directly behind it. I'm your friend. I mean you no harm. I will protect you. It voiced in an objectionable, monotone servitude, with an unpleasant, lifeless delivery. Its words were redundant. Every AI was programmed to say the same things, they were superfluous, like a broken record. There was perhaps no reason to warrant a conversation, because it was not going to reveal anything that we didn't already know about the demon machines. Rachel called on AI with levity. Hey, Rust Bucket, I'm sending you back to the junk heap of hell. She fired her electromagnetic railgun at point-blank range. The AI shook as the electric charge pulsated through its newly fired-up circuitry, and it fell with a metal clang. Good vernacular, I said. We don't have much time. We have to find the others and make our way back. This might have uh, woken up a hornet's nest. How was this thing out in the daytime? Rachel asked. I had no real answer to give her. Maybe they're adapting. If this is the case, then we're more than screwed. This was a disturbing consideration, to say the least. At that moment, the roof of our house cracked loudly, and where I was standing collapsed directly on top of me. I crumbled to the floor, not having a single second to decide or to brace myself. When the dust settled enough for me to see, I saw the faces of my friends with disturbed looks on their faces. 
I could hear them arguing, but could not hear them initially. Then I heard Rachel pleading, We cannot leave him. Henderson looked consternated. He said, We have to go. They're coming. I was completely trapped up to my shoulders. I didn't feel any pain, but I could have been in shock. I couldn't move my arms or legs at all. There was an enormous weight pressing on my chest. Maybe we need to end him. We don't want him to suffer, Erlanger mentioned, and this certainly got my attention. I tried to shake my head no, but my neck would not budge. No, we're not killing him, Rachel vehemently argued. Leaving him alive is a death sentence anyway. Erlanger seemed dead set on putting a bullet in my head. My mind was working fine, but I feared my spinal column had been compromised because I felt every bit paralyzed from the neck down. I thought just how inadvertently unlucky I was, and now, what, uh, what was this going to be, the apotheosis of my life's grandest moment? Henderson recovered his cross from his neck, placed it beside my head, and said, Sorry, old buddy. God have mercy on your soul. This was followed by Rachel saying, Goodbye, my friend. We have fought the good fight. She concluded her eulogy with, There is laid up for you treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and their thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. This was very worrisome and seemed very final. That was the last I saw of the three as they made their escape toward the cliff's edge to repel back to camp. I couldn't blame them. My situation was futile. It was pointless to be angry with them and no reason to be infuriated with any of them. Well, maybe Erlanger. Oddly, with the absolute quiet around me, it was genuinely peaceful. I had no way of knowing if I was going to be visited by a demon-driven AI or if I was going to die of exposure. If I survived the night, maybe my camp would decide to come back for me, if the coast was clear. Then again, I would imagine that they would pack up camp, since our hideout was most likely compromised. I didn't have to wait long until my silence and restfulness became all too apparent that visitors had arrived. I heard the rustling of debris, the scuttling and shuffling of feet, defiantly sounded like metal, which could be only one thing. I did not know for sure. If I played dead, maybe I could fool the demon into believing that I was not worth its time. I would rather it take my life than possess my soul. If this was an AI insurgent, I was dust. I thought maybe Erlanger had the right idea. Maybe they should have ended me. I was at the point of dissolution and degradation. I had no methods of warding off obliteration at the hands of the enemy. There were a couple of loud noises as if some large pieces of the house were being thrown about. Whatever was causing the disruption was most likely digging me out to examine me to see if I was possessible. This was a real fine mess. The unhallowed was near. I could feel it though I was sure I was paralyzed. If it takes my life, I pray that it's not done in some barbaric, grisly fashion. I had dreamed of my death in the past, and it was nothing like what was happening right now. My death was supposed to be seen by many, a riveting display of courage to cement my legacy. I did not want to gratify the caprice of a devil. I did not want to die on my back under the deceit of evil. I could believe that I was about to die without a fight, helpless, unable even to shout expletives or foul extractions. I felt nothing, yet I somehow knew my heart was racing. I wanted to be the hero, to be saving children or anything worthwhile when I died, not vulnerable at my weakest point. But isn't that how death is? It's a coward preying on the weak, the young, the defenseless, and the old. In my prime, I made many devil runs, but today, not that day. This day was unavoidable, but why could I not go out on my own terms? 
Most obstructions from the collapse were being lifted and moved to the side. In some ways, I honestly thought it might be my friends returning, having a change of heart, not able to live with themselves for abandoning me rather quickly. I was only fooling myself because now I saw the red eyes of the AI as it scanned me for signs of life. I knew there was no reason to play dead if its health sensors were on and activated. I could do nothing but lay still, motionless, subservient, trapped without clemency, and simply hope that the tin bucket was disinterested. The white metal bucket hovered over me with a blue blinking light on its left shoulder, indicating that there were signs of life in me. I thought, well, here it goes. Was I to be possessed by the demon inside of the Optimus Prime unit, or the Robocop going to terminate me with a simple stomp to the face? The AI straddled me, then reached down and took my confused head in its cold, unanimated fingers. I thought, oh no, this thing is going to crush my head by squeezing it until my brains gush out. That was a terrible thought. But that's not what happened at all. There was a tingling all the way through my body as if that which was listless in me, with no ability of its own to function, began snapping from its moribund state and pulse was restored to my limbs. Yet I was dizzy with vertigo and my soul seemed to be departing elsewhere. Everything became as dreary and black as night. I had full sensation again, but I was standing. I had not been indiscriminately eliminated. It was frigidly cold, but I didn't need to shiver. I was encased inside of something. It was as if I were in a virtual world. It didn't seem like a reality I was familiar with. Discombobulated would be an understatement. I realized I could move my legs, but the rest of me was still held captive under this mysterious power. I stepped away from the rubble, obstreperous but mobile. I remembered there was a mirror that most likely had hung in the living room wall near the front door, but was now propped up against the corner of the room where it managed to find its resting place. I made my way to the mirror. I needed to see for myself if I were injured badly. I was walking, so how could I be too damaged? Maybe a few cuts and scrapes, I imagined. I looked at my reflection in the mirror, and a further queasiness gave me a sense of true disorientation, for what I was seeing could not be so. I saw, looking back at me, the same, the very same AI robot that was recently hovering over me, checking my vital signs. Now my arms and head seemed to have gained their strength back. I lifted my arm to see a robotic arm. I turned and walked back to where I was on my back, buried under the mound of toppled house. My body was still there. I checked for signs of life. There was none. My body was dead. How did this conjunction happen? There must have been a transference of soul, spirit, energy, vibrations, or something spiritual upon my departing. I somehow entered the robot. My consciousness was now dispersed within the steel, body, aluminum, titanium, and plastic. I had a sense of algorithms, operating systems, unlimited date, iterative processing, and framework. This was unbelievably frightening, but yet it was all true. The AI absorbed my essence as I was dying. I was most peculiarly alive, but something was causing me alarm. It didn't seem as though I were alone. The robot was my prison, but it seemed as though I could exercise voluntary movement and had unforced memories and certain propensities. But did I have autonomy? I scanned the chasm of my network, weaved through my circuits and sensors, and elevated the data in seconds. I would have been better off dead. There was no way to extract what I had found hiding in my hard drive. I'd been compromised, and what I found was an encryption clearly in the hands of a demon. It read, 
We are the companion virus. You are contaminated. We are legion. I hope you enjoyed We Are Legion by Dale Thompson as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash dale-thompson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash d-a-l-e dash t-h-o-m-p-s-o-n. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Well, well, well. You think you're all set with a nice new body, only to find out it has a virus inside. Aren't there lemon laws against this kind of thing? Micah Edwards brings us the next story in which you may just decide your teeth don't really need to be checked every six months, or really at all ever again. Without further ado, I present to you Word of Mouth. Bad teeth ran in Logan's family. This was true, more or less. Certainly all of his grandparents had had dentures, as had his mother, and his father had more teeth missing than not. Genetically speaking, a smile was never going to have to be Logan's best attribute. That said, a bit of money spent on dental appointments growing up wouldn't have gone amiss. It wouldn't have fixed everything, but it might have at least shown Logan and his siblings that there was the possibility of a future without gum disease. Their parents, already resigned to their own plaque and decay, never tried particularly hard to instill good brushing habits in their children, who in turn looked at their parents' mouths and thought, why bother? By the time Logan learned that good habits could beat bad genetics, he'd already lost all of his cavity-riddled baby teeth and was well into damaging his permanent set. He gave it an honest shot all through college. He set alarms on his phone, reminding him to brush his teeth. He bought floss, then floss picks when he found that the floss tended to get snagged in his crooked teeth, then a water pick when even those didn't work. He suffered through the shame of having a dental hygienist tisk over the state of his mouth and the ensuing lecture from the dentist. Logan knew he deserved it for having spent twenty years neglecting his teeth. It was his penance, as was the astronomical bill the dentist quoted him to fix and fill everything. He could not afford to pay it, but he set a goal to save for it and, in the meantime, did his best to establish and maintain his new tooth routines. The distractions of college and the difficulty of change meant that uh, he was far from perfect about it, but he tried hard and expected the results of the next appointment to be much better. To Logan's surprise and embarrassment when he went in for his next cleaning a year later, he received the same pitying concern from the dental assistant. The dentist reviewed all of the dark spots on his x-rays and referred him to an oral surgeon for root canals and possibly even a tooth extraction. Logan didn't even ask what the cost for that would be. Over the course of a year, he'd managed to save up 70% of what the dentist had wanted for the previous repairs. Once words like specialist started being added to the mix, he knew that he would never be able to afford it. It was disheartening, to say the least. Logan found it hard to force himself to brush his teeth that night. The dentist had given him a special toothpaste formulated to reduce cavity formation, but even as it foamed up in his mouth, Logan stared at himself in the mirror and wondered why he was even pretending. He was obviously cursed to a lifetime of tooth pain, wrought an eventual loss just like the rest of his family. He'd done nothing but waste time and money trying to prevent it. It was all so useless. The next day, Logan spent the money he'd been saving to fix his teeth on a game system. 
His brushing became more sporadic and lapsed entirely for a while, until one of his friends made a careful comment about how his halitosis seemed to be returning. Wait, have I always had bad breath, he asked. His friend shrugged. I mean, not like that bad, but yeah. It was always like that, so I figured it was just something you had to deal with, and it seemed rude to bring it up. Then it went away last year. I, I didn't want to be like, hey, I can finally face you directly when we have a conversation, you know? Figured you'd changed your diet or something when we got to college and it had fixed it. But now it's coming back. So in case you do know uh, what you were eating that caused it or whatever, uh, you can look out for it. Anyway, seriously, it's not that bad. I just figured you'd want someone to let you know. Logan's face burned with the sudden arrival of two decades of accumulated shame. He thanked his friend, who was as eager to end the conversation as Logan was, and they said no more about it. After that, Logan made a renewed effort to keep his teeth brushed. In addition, he became very aware of where people were standing when he spoke. No one else ever mentioned his bad breath, but every time Logan felt a twinge of pain from his teeth, he wondered who else could smell the damage happening inside his mouth. Despite this, his brushing and flossing was still an intermittent thing, even if it never fell off to nothing again. The one habit he did firmly keep up was the yearly visit to a dentist for a cleaning and oral exam. He sat patiently through the application of sharp objects and painful pokes. He listened to the lectures and nodded at the explanations of what it would take to fix his teeth. He never made an appointment to fix the cavities, but he always brought whatever electric toothbrush or high-fluoride toothpaste they recommended to reduce their formation. Even though he could never afford the thousands of dollars to remove his sins entirely, he could pay the indulgence to minimize them. Logan knew it would have been still better if he actually used the tools daily, and every year he told himself that he would. Somehow, they always ended up sitting dry and accusing on the edge of the sink more often than not. Still, at least he had the option available, and he told himself that intermittent use of superior cleaning technology was better than regular use of something lesser. Things went on in this fashion for several years, until one day, shortly before his annual cleaning and flagellation, Logan received a text notifying him that his appointment had been canceled. Surprised, he went to the dentist's website to reestablish his request, only to find that the website was down as well. Odd, thought Logan. I suppose they closed? He didn't really want to find a new dentist. He liked this one. They'd been nicer than many about the condition of his teeth and relatively understanding of his quiet refusal to have them fixed. Obviously, he had not been their only patient with insufficient funds to tend to his luxury bones, as a website he had found called them. As a last resort, before he began the process of finding a new dentist, he called the number that had texted him. Uh, thank you for calling Dr. Bowler's office. Can I help you? Logan was at a momentary loss. He hadn't actually expected anyone to answer, given the cancellation and the absent website. Uh, yes, sorry, this is Logan Sims. I'm calling about next week's appointment. Oh, the receptionist sounded oddly startled, as if someone had just jabbed her awake. Yes, let me look. Ah, it looks like you were accidentally canceled. I guess so. And you still want that appointment? Well, yeah. There's nothing wrong there. No, it missed, must have been just one of those things. Computers, right? I'll get that set back up for you. You know, your website. I've got you back in the system, she said, talking over him. We'll see you on Thursday of next week. Thank you for calling. She hung up the call before Logan could let her know that the website was down. He thought about calling back, but eventually decided that they'd figure it out on their own. There was clearly something up with all of their systems. Now that they knew about it, they'd get it sorted out. 
He did call to confirm his appointment the day before, just to make sure that everything was correctly in the system this time. Do you need to reschedule? The receptionist asked him. We can waive the fee. No, there's no problem on my end. Just wanted to make sure I was still in the system this time. We've got you back in there, she assured him. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh, did you get your web... A sharp click told Legan that she had hung up the phone again. Probably someone else had come into the office. Anyway, they must have it fixed, their sight by now. This assumption almost made him late to his appointment the next day. Logan went to confirm the address of the office a couple hours before his cleaning and discovered that the website had not, in fact, been put back online. He knew how to get to the office park the clinic was in and was fortunately able to spot Dr. Boulder's name after only a couple of loops through nearly identical building complexes. He ended up a few minutes later than he'd wanted to be, but still on time for his appointment. Logan, the reception, greeted him as he walked in. She sounded like the same one who'd been answering the phone. The desk plate said her name was Everly. Okay, we'll get you back there in just a minute. Go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, did you know your website's down? He asked as he sat down. Everly gave him an overly bright smile. No, I'm sure that can't be. It is, though. Look. He turned his phone screen to face her showing the error. It's been like this for weeks. Has it? Her smile fluttered for a moment. Well, we'll certainly get that fixed. Thanks for letting me know. Her voice was oddly flat, and her smile didn't fully reach her eyes. Logan got the feeling that he'd stumbled onto some sort of internal office politics. He decided to wait quietly until he was called back. The uncomfortable wait was mercifully short. The hygienist opened the waiting room door and directed Logan back to one of the small cleaning rooms, then got him bibbed, settled, and leaned back in the chair. She went about scraping and tapping his teeth with the usual slightly disappointed professionalism. Every time the pick stopped to poke at the same area for an extended period of time, Logan had to swallow the urge to apologize. The dental assistant, on the other hand, said less than usual about Logan's teeth. He found it impossible to believe that things had actually gotten better, because he knew how lackadaisical he had been about cleaning his teeth. But perhaps he had reached sort of a plateau. Even maintaining his level of decay for a year would be a major victory. How's it look, he asked, once the various devices were out of his mouth. You're doing okay, she said, the most positive review he'd ever gotten. He immediately saw her grimace as if the comment had hurt. The doctor has a new treatment he'll probably recommend. I'll let you talk to him about it. Logan ran his teeth over his tongue as he waited, poking and probing at the freshly cleaned surfaces. Doing okay felt like a lie. He'd been nowhere close to the twice-a-day recommended brushing, and he'd seen her involuntarily flinch after delivering the line. It's probably some new technique to try to be kinder to the patients. He knew he didn't deserve the kindness. He wasn't taking care of his teeth. But when Dr. Boulder came in and opened his speech with, So you've got quite a few cavities, it was honestly a relief. Logan didn't want the dentist to treat him with kid gloves. He needed to hear how bad things were. There's a new device that I think can help you a lot, said the doctor. Have you heard of the Smilata? Logan had not. Well, despite everything, it turns out that most people still don't brush their teeth as often as they ought to, said Dr. Bowler, giving him a knowing look. We've been trying for a hundred years to get people to maintain a good routine of brushing and flushing. You'd think it would be easy, right? No one likes tooth pain. So, do you know why it's so bad? Logan did not. Most of the nerves connect to the spine and go up to the brain that way. There are all sorts of things in the spine to interpret and regulate the signals that the whole body is sending. It's good at that. But your teeth all connect to one thing that's called the trigeminal nerve, which bypasses the spine and goes directly to the brain. It's hardwired right in. Totally skips all of the blockers and controllers that everything else has. So when your teeth hurt, 
You know about it instantly and intensely. He laughed. So you'd <laughs> really think it'd be hard to get people to maintain them. But here we are. The good news is we've got something better than a luxury to help you now, and that's the Smilata. Dr. Bowler reached into a pocket of his white coat and produced a small metal device, a little larger than a quarter. It was disc-shaped with small filigree wires coming off at various points around the outside. He held it out for Logan's inspection. Have you ever seen those cleaner shrimp that climb into fish's mouths and pick out all the detritus for them? Well, this is based off of that concept. You pop this little thing into your mouth at night and it cleans your teeth for you. All those little crevices that you miss when you brush, all the bits that the floss misses, it gets them all. It's honestly incredible. Now, how do you sleep through that? Asked Logan. You barely feel it. In fact, I've got one in right now, said the doctor. He tilted his head back and opened his mouth. Logan peered in and saw one of the glittering devices nestled on the roof of his mouth in between his teeth. How does it stay in place? See the little filaments? The doctor poked at the device with his palm, making it stretch and retract its hair-like extensions. They fix it in place. It holds onto your teeth so you barely even notice it. I wear mine all day long now. I never take it out. His eyes locked onto Logan's with a strange urgency. It's always in. Logan sighed. If this was the new gadget... At least it was more than just a fancier version of the same old toothbrush. How much does this cost? That's not bad, said Dr. Bowler. The first look in his eyes was gone, replaced by resignation. Four hundred dollars, but they offer a 24-month no-interest plan with free returns for the first 60 days if it doesn't work for you. How much is the... Sixteen sixty-seven per month said the doctor, who had clearly given this pitch before. Less than four dollars a week. And I can personally guarantee that it does all that it says and more. He smiled, showing Logan his dazzlingly white, perfectly straight teeth. Can I try it out? Well, absolutely. This one's fresh out of the packaging. Just open up. Logan obliged. The doctor put his glove, thumb into Logan's mouth and pressed the metal disc against the roof. It was cold against the soft palate, followed by a brief tingling sensation that seemed to come from everywhere in his top teeth at once. After that, Logan couldn't feel it at all. The doctor withdrew his hand. How's that? Logan put his own fingers in his mouth, feeling around curiously. The device was there, yielding slightly to his touch. He could feel the thin sharpness of the wires reaching out to all of his top teeth, though he couldn't feel where they wrapped around. He imagined that they were below the gum line. Odd, but only because I know it's there. How do I activate it? Oh, it's already working. The little wires dig out tiny particles and pass them back to the main disc, which incinerates them. You swallow the residue. Is that safe? It's as safe as what you were eating anyway. Logan thought about the frequency of his consumption of sugar and junk food and said nothing. He knew the dentist knew. If you want to try it out, said Dr. Bowler, then you can just wear that one home and I'll get you to fill out the paperwork on your way out. That night, Logan stood in front of his bathroom mirror trying to see the device in his own mouth. His phone camera confirmed what his clumsy explorations had suggested— the top of the device, at least, was a featureless disc with no apparent method for removal. He had twisted and pulled and pushed, but the smilata seemed inclined to stay exactly where it was. Got something stuck in your teeth? asked roommate Dylan, walking by. Nah, it's just this new thing from the dentist. I forgot to ask him how to take it out. Logan pulled on the smilata again, which remained firmly in place. Want me to give it a shot? Yeah, no, I... A sudden bolt of pain lanced through Logan's head. A bright spike of agony from his teeth. He listed to the side, clutching at the doorframe. Oh, dude, you okay? Yeah. Logan caught his breath. Yeah, oh, wow. Just, whoa, not gonna pull on like that again. I don't know. 
If it's coming at you like that, maybe you need to get it out right now. A dull ache started to build in Logan's teeth. It was an echo of the previous agony, a reminder of what pain could be. It felt somehow like a warning. You might be, Logan began. The ache grew stronger, becoming a throbbing pain. It was nowhere near the level he had just felt, but it promised that it could become that only for much longer. He switched what he'd been about to say. Nah, I don't think it's the issue. Immediately the pain ceased. Are you sure? Yeah, I mean the doctor put it in there because my teeth needed help. The pain did not return. That was just, well, it's just doing what it's supposed to. If you say so, man, Dylan did not sound convinced. You sure you're all right? I am. Logan felt his mouth pulled into a smile that he didn't intend. It came from the inside, tiny wires pricking at his cheeks and lips to force them upward. The sensation was terrifying. He dared not let his fear show in his face, where the smilata would be able to feel it. I'm just... I'm going to make sure it's settled in place. You need the bathroom before I take it up for a bit? Dylan responded in the negative, and Logan retreated to the bathroom. The wires withdrew from inside his lips and allowed his smile to lapse, for which he was grateful. With shaking hands, he took out his phone and called the dentist's office. Uh, Dr. Bowler's office, how can I help you? Hi, said Logan, trying to keep his voice calm. I got the smilata earlier. How do I take it out? You don't, said Everly. But if I needed to, for you can't. It won't let you. Logan's mind stuttered. He could hear his heartbeat rushing in his ears. What? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I couldn't tell you before. It wouldn't let me. Does Dr. Bowler know? He's a good man. You can't blame him. He put this torture device in my mouth. I think I can. You haven't felt it yet. You don't know what it can do. It, we tried to stop you. Your appointment, the website. It can't see. It didn't know until you called, until you said it where it could hear. You canceled it to stop me from coming in? Logan's voice was dull in his own ears. You didn't think I might check in about that? That's all I could do. It hurt me for that. That's why I'm here now. Logan checked the time, suddenly realizing that there was no reason for the office to still be open. It's keeping you there. It won't let me go home. Even if I could make myself push through the pain, I couldn't drive like this. It makes me answer the phone in case anyone calls. For what? What does it want? She laughed bitterly. <laughs> the same as anything. It wants to spread. Is it talking to you yet? It will. Logan hung up on her this time. The phone clattered to the counter as he attempted to process the receptionist's words. It was insane, impossible. Even if the disc was stuck, malfunctioning somehow, it wasn't alive. Logan's thoughts were interrupted by the writhing of his own lips. He could feel them struggling to form words without sound. Tiny tendrils seized his tongue, moving it in concert. Logan stared into the mirror in horror and incomprehension. He couldn't make out the words, couldn't read his own lips. After a moment, it occurred to him to breathe out, to provide the air that was missing from the motion of speech. Hath hell him It took several long breaths and careful listening before Logan was able to make out the message his mouth was making. Tell him. What? Tell, tell who? This one was easier to parse. Homemate. Roommate. Tell him what? Who smile at her good. Absolutely not. Just because you were inflicted on me doesn't mean I'm going to drag anyone else into this. The next glance of pain was so intense that it did not even register as a physical sensation. It arrived in Logan's brain as blindingly bright metal bars of absolute white, overwhelming all of his senses. 
He woke on the floor, bleeding from his forehead where he'd cracked it on the edge of the counter as he blacked out. His teeth were in agony. He tried to open his mouth to cry out, but his lips refused to part. The pain grew stronger, edging back toward the top of the scale, then mercifully vanished as abruptly as it began. After a moment, Logan dragged himself shakily from the floor. As he examined the lump on his head in the mirror, he saw his lips move again. First, they formed a pursed shape, the sign for shh. Next, two short phrases he'd already seen. Tell him. Smell that a good. When Logan exited the bathroom, Dylan was sitting on the couch in the main room. You got that thing all settled, he called. Yeah, all set. A mild ache rose, just the merest wisp of a threat. Logan cleared his throat and added, I'm looking forward to see how it works. I think it's going to be a real game changer. Hey, if it's good, let me know. I wouldn't mind upping my game. Logan felt the artificial smile form again. Don't you worry. I think I'm going to let everyone know. The worst part, he thought, was that his teeth really did feel better than they had in years, when Smilato wasn't actively tormenting him. You could have just done your job, Logan whispered to himself. I would have praised you willingly. You didn't have to force me. He felt his lips move and breathed out to hear the message... This way more fun. Logan laid back in his pillow and silently cried. The tears ran down past his unwilling smile. I hope you enjoyed Word of Mouth by Micah Edwards as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented featured author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Micah Edwards. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash M I C A H dash E D W A R D S. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author, as well as all of our other authors who provided us with stories tonight. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark and for all 15 seasons of chills, thrills, and assorted mayhem. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, Please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as five bucks a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, or X... Instagram or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back 10 years to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Chiry. Until next week, stay spooky. Get some sleep, if you can. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I just noticed that the for sale sign is gone from next door. Amazing. Somebody purchased the house within just the past hour or so. I wonder who that could be. Oh, hello there. Can I help you? 
Yes, hello. My name is Malcolm Blackwood. I just moved in next door. I was wondering if I could borrow... Oh, my. Are you Otis Gyre? Mm, why, yes. Do we know each other? No, I, I don't believe we've met, but I am a firm admirer of your work. Let me just say that you've inspired me. I have? Well, that's very flattering. Tell me, do you like tea? I've been making a pot for enjoying once I've finished. Finished? Oh, I apologize. I didn't realize you had company. Yes, my dear listeners. Interesting. I've always had an interest in speaking before a crowd. Usually, though, they're too... dead to enjoy it. My, what a shame. Maybe you can give it a try with them sometime soon. But back to that tea. Do you prefer anything with it? Cream, sugar, or something else? Rest assured, I only use the finest natural ingredients. They're to die for, honestly. Hmm, perhaps another time. I do enjoy a good warm cup, but not necessarily tea. What I was coming to see, though, is if I could borrow a shovel. Oh, planning on doing some gardening? At this hour? Yes, it's simply a mess out back, and I have to get some work done back there. Immediately. I see. I suppose you can borrow it, but be sure to return it as soon as you're done. I don't like to let people borrow things for too long. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you, but don't let me keep you from your work. By the way, just to ask, do you have any skeletons in your closet? Why do you ask? <laughs> Would you like some? <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted, and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Chirey. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors, Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. 
Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>